very good morning to you, wherever you may be joining us, and if you're in the room, and a good, good morning to our panel. Uh, over tourism, we're full, is the... Yeah, yeah, I can already see the Swiss gentleman here shaking, shaking his head. And Tony will be having a conniption before we're finished <laughs> on the idea of over tourism. No such thing. <laughs> <laughs> you can see how this is going to go. Uh, a, a very warm welcome to the discussion on over tourism. The thing about over tourism is nobody really wants to deal with it. Because to deal with over tourism is to sort of have to deal with the dirty little secret. Yeah. that the industry is the most favourite industry in the world, mm. but is having phenomenal difficulty handling its growth. It, yeah. And with me is Stephen Cotton, the General Secretary of the International Transport Workers Federation. Gosh, that's a mouthful. You're going to give us the workers' view, are you? I am, so thank you, Richard. Um, for us, I think we have to recognise pre-pandemic, we had some infrastructure challenges. And we, we rec so we represent transport workers, but we're also recognised through the pandemic. We need to build a better relationship with the stakeholders about what do we, what do we aspire to have? Because oh, but come on, at the end of the day, more tourism, more jobs, more members, better for you all. Yes. Right, there we go then. <laughs> <laughs> but with standards, with structure, with development, with the right image. So the reality is we all have... You know, you're the best advert for travel. The reality is you have to build the infrastructure, you have to make sure there's a distribution between capital and the, the workers. And we see the expansion into the other continents of the world. So at the moment, you can fly so many times a day from London to New York. But what about Africa? What about other places? And how do we make sure, first, the standards of the transport people are global? Safety is the key issue. Mm -hmm. And then when... When it comes to tourism, it's hospitality. And we all know we're struggling to recruit people into hospitality. We're going to talk about that because I'm... I'm I, I, well, we'll come to this in a second. Jane Sun, the CEO of Trip.com. Um, the... Arguably, you're part of the problem. I mean, if it wasn't such a good app and website, if it didn't have so many you know, hundreds of thousands of offers, people wouldn't travel as much. If we don't have a car, we're still riding horses, but we cannot stop the train. Well, that's one way of looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> but you can only do so much for so long before we have to have fundamental change. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah, I think the best way to address the over-tourism is really promoting the long tail. Uh, destination, like Tony did. We attended a meeting with the Mongolian Travel Bureau. They, every year, such a big country, they only have 700,000 people visiting them. So easily right, but the they can't cope with too many more. They don't, right. have either, they don't have either the air infrastructure or, and Tony will come to that in a second, either the air infrastructure, the hotel numbers, or the transportation infrastructure to move people around the country. If there is a demand, the free market will enable entrepreneurs to build. But demand is important. That's fascinating. That's sort of a... If, that's the opposite of if you build it, they will come. That's saying they will come and we better build it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk to, to, to uh, Sitimli Natumbula, the acting chief executive of Brand South Africa. You've got the bulk of African tourism. Absolutely. You've got multiple destinations mm -hmm. um, and you've done a better job than most at shifting people around the country. Yeah. But that's more by accident than by design. That's no, <laughs> no, it's intentional. Well, you say that, but, I mean, you know, you, the Kruger's in the north, the Cape is on the west, the other Cape's on the east, and Joburg's in the middle. Absolutely, it's intentional. That's the strategy. You come to one of a kind of country where you can do hell of a lot in few hours. You can go to the coastal area, you go to the big five. It's a, in, the, in a matter of three hours movement. So we did it deliberately, but also to empower people across South Africa, across all provinces. So the strategy, I mean, for us, tourism is very big. We're talking about a six point, almost 6.4 contribution to the GDP. Mm. And annually, 1.1 million jobs, and you know that's our challenge. Some people would say it's more than 6% of GDP, actually. Yeah. If you look at the indirect... And indirect, the unmeasured ones, absolutely. But it is a, a critical and a strategic market for us. Hence the point to 
to build more demand and create more awareness. Tony, you really are the problem. <laughs> <laughs> How many, let's do it this way. How many new routes will your various airlines open this year? About 42 wow. um, this year. I mean, we, we, we started 20 odd years ago with two planes. We've grown to 240. We went through COVID. I think just going through Jane's point, one of the things we did, 60% of our routes were routes that were never done before. Mm. So it's not about everyone going to Bali or everyone going to Phuket. We opened routes that were never done before. So part of the solution in over tourism is um, rerouting people to new markets, such as we just mentioned Mongolia, et cetera. In China, for instance, most people look at China as uh, people leaving China and, and the mass amount of tourism. But at AirAsia, we brought 40% of the people that came into China. Uh, because China is a, is a huge, huge. tourist uh, inbound market as well, but many airlines don't promote those destinations. Um, Why do you think that is? I mean, there are certain visa difficulties and putting aside the COVID issues, why do you think that is? Well, it's easy to focus on the outbound market. It's sure. much harder to go and promote Xi'an sure. or, uh, you know, Guangzhou, etc. cetera. So but we saw a, a huge opportunity in that. I think the other thing about over-tourism, uh, you know, is education to the tourists coming in. Ah. That, you know, airlines such as ours or, or websites can educate yeah. um, the inbound tourists on protecting the environment. Mm. And I think more and more people are doing that. I, I don't see over-tourism as a, as a real issue. Um, if you were to spread the tourism around a bit better and you were to educate people as well. And uh, sustainability is not just about the environment. It's, a, uh, you know, in terms of carbon, but it's also in terms of protecting the environments that you're going to as well. And so, culture. So the story I was going to tell earlier is I started travelling pretty quickly after COVID. Oh, I mean, in 20, I was on the road again by June because mm. we had things mm. to cover. And then in July, I remember being in Prague you know, when it was mission accomplished until they all went funny. And then back to Venice when things reopened and it was just as if nothing had changed. <laughs> it was packed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely packed mm -hmm. to the rafters. <laughs> and then when Dubrovnik in Croatia, oh. when the first cruise ship arrived, I was there. <laughs> packed. <laughs> so, did we, uh, so, so, Stephen, did we miss a chance during the pandemic to make fundamental change you know, the pandemic, bad though it was at yeah. tourism, but it was the equivalent of control-alt-delete for tourism. Mm. And all we did was reboot with the same problems in the software. Fully agree. I think the reality is, certainly in air transportation, we lost a, a lot of good people mm. with a lot of experience. And I think everybody who's travelled since then mm. has experienced lost bags and challenges. And we're working with the ground handling companies to try to make sure that we bring people in and retain them. So the question more, and this comes more to the tourism, and again, you know, we're, we're in Davos and you can imagine how seasonal the input of all the people are this week. It's the method of employment in some senses. So there's a conversation when we look in Europe, you know, it's not unusual. We, we cover sort of the cruise ships, we cover the ferries in Greece. They work in the summer, in the winter, they work ashore in restaurants and different. So we have to look at what are we doing for that. And then I think, certainly when we talk about young people, do young people aspire to be in hospitality? Mm. And that's a challenge for all of us. How do we make sure it's a good job? We have, you know, we're, we're the cruise market, growing, growing, growing. We're having to recruit. We recruit primarily from the global south. And these are opportunities for distribution of wealth, but it's also how do we build a an attraction to these jobs because many of the hotels you visit right. probably don't provide the same services before. So what changes, Shetembri, did you make in South Africa post, pre-pandemic to post? What are you doing? What's the number one way to avoid over-tourism in that sense? You know, I wish we had over-tourism, but, but we don't. <laughs> uh, okay. What we do have and what you have possibly experienced is seasonal tourism where we get an influx, but we are addressing that because there are mechanisms that you can use in place. For instance, you know, adopting to the digital world, 
and, and transforming your booking system. That is what is currently underway. I'll tell you about the collaboration we have currently with Google, yeah. which is a public and private, to protect, number one, tourists, and number two, to make sure that we empower you know, our SMMEs by taking those that are not known and bringing them up to the okay. floor. Right. But at the end of the day, yeah. mm. the, and Tony would probably forcefully say this, the consumer will go when the consumer wants to travel. Not quite in South Africa. The consumer goes where they want to travel until they listen to one of us. And then there's a paradigm shift. You're there's not going to go to Cape Town in the winter. You can, why not? There's ample of wine. What are you talking about? <laughs> wine will keep you warm. And because if you're beautiful. coming from the Northern Hemisphere. Of yeah. course. But our winter is nothing compared to any other country. Mm. He's talking about the maximum of 15, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so another thing we can do better is the promotion of the long tail destination. What do you mean by long tail? Just long tail destination, for example, everyone knows about Egypt, New York, London, right? But in a remote side, uh, where people, a beautiful scenery, nobody had been to. So as a tourism board, we need to do a better job. In the past, we don't have the technology to do that. Now with the videos, with the KOLs, a lot of long tail uh, destinations are much better prepared to host the customers. The problem with that, and I hate to sort of be sort of the person who sits here and pours water on everything, but is you've got to get people to want to go there. Yep, yep. And they want to see the famous things first. People want first to... First trip, first trip. You want to go and see the canals of Venice, mm -hmm. the Parthenon, and all, you know, right. the Tavern. And even those countries that have tried it have found it very difficult. So, mm -hmm. classic case, Thailand. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, I mean, Thailand was the first country that went big on the numbers. Mm -hmm. We're going to get the numbers. Mm -hmm. And then once they got the numbers, <laughs> they said, now we're going to have to improve the quality mm. of the tourists. In other words, we want uh, expensive Australian tourists. Mm. And now we're going to shif shift people to different parts of the country, mm. dispersing, which is your point, isn't it? But it's not really worked. Mm. I think it's not going to be overnight, but efforts need to be persistent. For example, in Japan, everyone will go to Tokyo, uh, Niseiko, uh, Kyoto. But many of our customers go to Japan 12 times a year. Now they start to explore the beautiful Fuji Mountain, do hikings, go to the national park. There are more than 20 national parks over there. And gradually, people start to go to re remote areas. It can be done. It's not going to be overnight. But we need to put the concerted efforts in promoting these long tail destinations. But that's, what's not, that's not happening. In a sense, the industry is still obsessed with numbers. Mm. And Tony, is, Tony is doing quite mm. a lot, right? He is flying to these uh, travel destinations that are not very popular. But <clears throat> I think that there are two things here. One is I'm actually wondering what is the problems of over-tourism. Uh, no Infrastructure, one's... environment, no, what, what, damage to the, in, to the, uh, to the culture. Well, no one's really quantified that to me as to what it is. Two is... Over to a, the market solves itself. If you go to a place and there are millions of people and it's really uncomfortable, you're not going to go. But just picking up a point here, and, and Naseko, for instance, mm. was known as a traditional ski resort. ski resort. But we worked with the Japanese tourism board to make it a year-long destination. Because in the summer, Naseko is as beautiful as in the winter. And so you know, we went on a, on a daily flight. So I think... One thing, the market eventually will sort itself out because if it's a very unpleasant place to visit because there are too many people, mm. no one's going to go and they'll spread out to different versions. Airlines such as ours and others will have to provide connectivity to other places, which is one. Two is there is a seasonal aspect. Mm. You know, sure. I, I don't feel there is an over-tourism for the whole year. Um, you know, maybe in bits in the summer or winter, etc. cetera. Um, but <clears throat> also... As I said, the, the infrastructure, Thailand, for instance, you just mentioned, they're actually going gangbusters again. They're, you know, they're opening bars till five in the morning. They've got rid of visas. Um, so there's no effects of uh, over-tourism in Bangkok, which is the biggest place, or Phuket, where they're, they're building new airports. Well, but I ultimately feel the consumer will decide whether this is a horrible place to go to because the country hasn't done its, its uh, efforts in, in making it a better place um, and go somewhere else. Well, yes, but 
dot, dot, dot. The consumer will decide, but you've got a consumer that's an experienced travel consumer. You've got a people uh, once a year, and you've got the newbie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the newbie will maybe go by price, which you will lower prices, so you'll get more people there. And really, we're talking about the damage done to the resort as much as the experience of... I mean, you're right. If you have a shitty experience in a place, you're not going to go back. And you'll have regretted going there in the first place. And before long, all your comments on trip.com will say just that. And people won't go. But the damage to the resort and to, to his members. But that's, that's what, I, um, what I ascribe to, that education and working with the local communities to explain what is important in that, in that part of the world. Um, you know, I, I had my first trip to Tanzania and we're about to, to fly there. And the education we received on what we should do, what we shouldn't do, where we, what was was very good because mm. you know coming from Southeast Asia, I had no idea. Mm. Uh, so yes, I think that's a fair point on the the damage when you bring millions of tourists to uh, a new resort, you you run the risk of lots of damage from from waste to uh, degradation, etc. So that I do agree that we can all do a better job educating that and the working with the local communities. The problem is you can't put the travel genie back in the bottle in a sense, mm. uh, particularly yeah. post-pandemic where, you know, the, the bucket list, the experience, yep. everybody, until the money runs out, everybody wants to keep tra uh, to, to travelling. So I wonder if you have to start thinking more dramatically and drastically. Mm. Permits, charging, uh, obviously the visa regime making it easier, timed entries, mm. all those sort of things. Yeah, absolutely. I think we should take a very balanced view. Uh, if we have no uh, management for the travel destination, it will be overcrowded. Uh, the user's experience will not be very good. But if we push too far, for example, the one extreme case is three years of lockdown. Nobody travel, right? The tourism, there is no over-tourism at all, but it's not going to work. So we need to find a way that demand and supply can eventually, gradually grow side by side. And technology can play a very good role. So you end up with Venice or Amsterdam banning cruise ships. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that sort of doesn't really help your members. Well, um, we work quite closely with most of the cruise companies and we did a lot of work with them in the pandemic. Moving crew back from the ships was a challenge. But the reality is there's a lot of venues. Mm. It depends on the size of the ship. And I think if we want to be very rounded about it, we have to have a multi-stakeholder approach to it because the distribution of wealth, the, create, the creation of good jobs mm. has to be Balance. part of the conversation. Yeah. Mm. The reality is business travel has recovered way quicker than we anticipated. Mm. We work with most, nearly all of the major airlines and the reality is they have union representation, we have conversations. But I think, you know, Tourism is also the experience, and you're very right, there's different sectors and there's different markets. But it could also be part of the marketing that you have an infrastructure, mm -hmm. that you have a partnership between government, mm -hmm. companies and unions. Because for us, we, we see Africa will grow. Yeah. It's impossible not to. Mm -hmm. 2018, we left our big convention and we thought civil aviation was going to boom. It took a terrible hit through those three years. We're nearly back to pre-pandemic figures. And the order book is enormous. So... They have to run a good business. They have to have good social packages for people. But we have still seen a, a weakness in the hospitality, in the hotels, in the services mm. to get people into the business. Mm. Different people would bring people from other parts of the world. But in reality, in Africa, there were plenty of clever, inspirational people that should be part of the process. And we need to look at that for everybody. He's quite right. But, you know, I wish... I think our scenario is quite unique um, in that from a services perspective. For those that have been, by the way, to South Africa, you ask one person, what is it about South Africa? And they'll tell you, Richard, it's, a, it's, it's about the service, it's the warmth and friendliness people. of people. So we have a youth, 60% odd youth, that wants to be in the tourism, in the hospitality industry. And right now, the interventions are in place to train those people and make sure it's an inclusive growth that benefits not only the elitists, but only people that are also from the bottom up. So we are using a bottom up and the top down approach. And I think that is what will set us apart. Tony, thank you. Yes. Richard, just going to your point, I mean, th there is validity in certain places in, in saying 
you know, you need permits, you need certain times to go. Bhutan, for instance, you know, it has certain um, numbers of people can go. Certain caves and certain natural reserves need control. But I think some of the decisions made are populist by, by politicians and, and should be left to the market. Uh, so th there is a balance, and I think that's the key. And overreaction sometimes will lead to the loss of jobs. If I could turn it back, everyone's hysterical about making sure every airline has sustainable aviation fuel. Um, but where are we going to get it from? Yeah. And the cost of sustainable aviation fuel is about 10 times the price of very expensive oil price. So how are you going to get to your net zero? Uh, well, we won't. Not, uh, not for a while. I mean, <laughs> and, I, and I think this greenwashing is also, we, we all have to do, we rely on the engine providers, we rely on so similar leverage fuel. And then we talk about um, uh, taxing our passengers, you know, a green tax. But then I keep looking for projects in my part of the world to put those carbon credits into. You know, Corsair will come up with a bunch of regulations, so there's no one in Southeast Asia can actually make those projects. So there's lots of gaps in here uh, that I'm saying, you know, the airline industry, the tourism industry comes in for a lot of negative flack when actually it's probably one of the best earners and probably one of the best ways of generating wealth. Um, and the hysteria is over small bits and pieces, I think. Yeah. South African point is very valid. Um, and as we all get, you know, Visa and MasterCard did studies that travel is still the number one discretionary spend, aside of COVID. Um, <clears throat> yes, certain areas can manage its place better by distributing its tourists, but I think people want to travel, and the market will eventually uh, sort itself out. But we shouldn't be hysterical and make populist decisions, um, such so as so like issues. nightmares. No, I mean nightmares as opposed to nightmares. Yeah, <laughs> mares who look after the night. Correct. M a y r o s, uh, which I see Barcelona's just introduced mm -hmm. to make it sort of more habitable and palatable mm -hmm. in a in a place. But let me just. Mm -hmm. There are better ways of managing it than banning, Yes, is my point. Yes. Mm. So yesterday we had a meeting with all the governors who are very involved in the travel uh, industry. If you travel around the world, the shortage of the laborers is prevailing. Uh, however, now technology enables us to eliminate a lot of frictions. For example, do we really need three hours waiting in the airport to go through the security check? and immigrations. Can we use biometrics to reduce some well, of the times? So the answer to that is yes, we can use biometrics and many people, but the investment isn't being put into it in the sense. Mm. Some places are, mm. yes, <clears throat> but the investment isn't being put into it. That is a great area for government to pr make pre-investment for the long-term gain. But let's just take Heathrow, for example. <laughs> Sorry, was that a big sigh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's... <laughs> Overdue, I think. It's such a big city, we need to better investment there. But look at Hong Kong, Singapore, and Dubai. I think it's seamless. When you go in, you hardly need to talk to anybody, right? There is good role model in place. Yes, Every but need, can none learn. of those places, with maybe the exception of Singapore, but none of those places had to concern themselves with electorates mm -hmm. that uh, could get volatile on things like extra runways expansion or increased air traffic. I think the, um, a good government should really make investment for the future, not focusing only on today's business. OK, but related to this, 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 this idea, isn't one of the core problems that the industry in individual countries... Mm -hmm. Oh, this is hard to say. Um, despite the fact it's 10% of whatever and it's 10% of employment, whatever, the, the numbers are somewhat dubious, but that's a good round number. It doesn't carry much weight. The politicians involved in tourism don't carry much weight. Tourism is considered to be that nice industry, uh, but, it's, but actually when you get to cabinet level, this is the truth, when you get to cabinet level, it always loses out to finance, to defence, to industry, to commerce. The US doesn't even have a tourism secretary. I couldn't even tell you the name of the UK tourism secretary, <laughs> let alone have I ever interviewed him or her or them. I think there's, there's two points. So first, well, I want to pick up on Seth. We have to do more, and it's just... Who pays for it? Ultimately, the customer pays, right? That's yeah, no, 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 that's further down the road. Who pays 
for the development, production and execution and implementation of SAF to get it to acceptable numbers. So we have the same dynamic. We have to agree which models we're going to use and how do we upscale. We have the same in shipping. We have diesel fuel, we have to move to ammonia or hydrogen and everyone's looking for someone else to start. So this is where competition is good, but we also have to have a collaboration on what's the right answer. Because I think you may find young travellers won't travel if the emissions are too high and there's no real attempt to deal with it in civil aviation. The question about autonomy, big issue for workers, we genuinely think autonomy, AI, can improve the quality of the jobs. You know, menial tasks. Who wants to do menial tasks? Our problem in tourism and travel is in travel we've, in, we've lost the, the glean of transportation when it comes to civil aviation. We have to recreate that. But in the end, service is also service. People appreciate service. Mm. South African hospitality. Mm. The, the, the so, why didn't, of so why didn't they come back? This is what I want. One of the great... Pan I mean, I'll take some questions in a moment. One of the great pandemic issue questions... The, you know, the black hole where all these jobs went into. People left the industry. Where do they go? Every other industry seems to be also be having problems recruiting and, and stuff. Where did they go? So we have anecdotal evidence. So we, I think we lost half of civil aviation folks. You have to think about the practical things, right? You travel to work. Many airports are not downtown mm -hmm. for lots of obvious reasons. You're not paid. The security rate, the quality of life, I think, is the big balance that's an impact for us about how do we deal with this, but also for who do we recruit? Mm. And we see this in a lot of our sectors. Young people's expectations for jobs are quite different mm. from the folks we recruited 30 years ago. Yeah. So we have to look at all of these things, challenges for us, but for all of us. And also, uh, lots of young people prefer to work in the office environment because now we have flexible working hours. For the service industry, we don't have that flexibility. How many, uh, how many crew are you hoping to recruit this year? Uh, we're about 1,000, 1,000, about 200 pilots. We have 7,000 crew and 2,000 pilots. We don't seem to have a problem. We don't have a union. <laughs> Unfortunately. Uh, or yet, we don't we need put it that union. way, right? Everyone, we're a big one happy commune. Uh, 22 years, not one day of industrial. But each day, yeah, I get the... I've asked the General Secretary to come and visit us. We're going to have a conversation, let's put it like <laughs> that. Each, each day I get the CAFA morning briefing email, and it always says, Ryanair holding crew recruitment in Exity. Whiz hold, you know, I saw this morning um, Lufthansa's hoping to employ 2,000, you know, extra this, that or the other. So the, the, the jobs are coming back. Yeah. I want to focus. You asked me, have you got a question? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, how can you be doing? Uh, well, don't worry. From our point of view, <laughs> uh, from our point of view the issue was not over tourism to mm. a degree. It was actually how do we get more value from the tourist sector uh, rather than just rely on volume, but actually get people to stay a little bit longer, get people to go to places where others aren't going. Um, and also, we've taxed the tourists in order to build our infrastructure. Right, just but, but have it there. New Zealand is a somewhat... Distant. No, unique situation. It's a unique situation. Number one, <laughs> distance yeah. has meant that you haven't had the numbers to start, yeah. or you haven't had them. And, but number two is, you know, get... You, since you never got to that over-tourism level, you're now trying to do all the other things. Well, I mean, basically what we're worried about is our productivity as an economy. Are we getting the best value? And tourism has relied too much on just picking up the numbers, putting them on buses uh, and doing that kind of thing, rather than relying much more on quality, getting to stay a bit longer, staying at hotels, et cetera, et cetera. Right, but the new, uh, the new routes... The ANZ and the Qantas yeah. routes, the non-stops to New York, and yeah. these will, will, will greatly increase your numbers. Mm. Yeah, so um, I think you, uh, New Zealand, uh, for this Chinese New Year, will bring lots of high-end customers over there. Uh, I talked to Tony. The most expensive tool we sell, Trip.com sell, costs about 200,000 USD per person per trip. How much? 200,000. What the hell did you give them for that? <laughs> and 80 days around the world. Conversation with you. 80 days around the world. And, and, the, and, and the other 192,000. <laughs> and guess how long did it take us to sell these packages? Come on. Take a guess. 
Well, I mean, 200,000 in Asia very quickly. How quick? Oh, no, no, I'm not going to. guess. <laughs> How quickly? Give guess. In days or... I think uh, it's talking about hours. Has hours, eh? It's seconds, probably. It's China. hours. Go on. 17 seconds. Yes. So I think when the country is doing its branding, we really need to make sure, first of all, you do the right branding. Are you really looking for volume or are you looking for my product, right, which is less price sensitive or high end users and team up with the right partner? But, but New Zealand is a good example because New Zealand's a bit like Africa when it comes to mo yeah. mobile phones and landlines. Yeah. New Zealand can jump the numbers game because you never got that you know you didn't suffer that problem of the vast numbers so you can immediately start building next question any other who, who else would like to to join this discussion yes ah oh, switzerland <laughs> i would like to ask uh, one of the uh, of the panel members if maybe this is a, uh, a a discussion which is not really over tourism but overpopulation are we uh, discussing uh, the fact that everything gets more dense, everything gets more crowded, everything gets more expensive, and actually now we're having the discussion uh, away from uh, from the actual problem. Mm. Mm. So population, um, China is running a very severe issue because we had a one-child policy. Now the government is working very hard to reverse the trend. It's very difficult. If you look at the trend, when GDP per capita reaches 10,000 USD mm. per person, birth rate will automatically come down. So if we run the model, the world probably will be peaked at about 9 billion. So um, not, not really an overpopulation issue. Just remind me the population of China again. 1.4 billion. Right, and at the moment, the percentage that travels outside the country? About 155 million in 2019. So you're talking about a really small percentage. Small percent. About so if China increases, which of course I, was, I presume, Tony, you're getting your planes ready, even by a small percentage, mm. the numbers become huge. Tony will be very happy, right? Uh, they'll all be flying on AirAsia as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh. <laughs> but I also think it's about promoting your point, eco-friendly mm. tourism. Because think about it, at the Kruger National Park, you cannot really afford overcrowding for mere reasons, because how, you, how do you contain that crowd? And it's then, very and, unpleasant and then, when you go on a drive exactly. and there are at least you know, 15 other vehicles all chasing that one poor giraffe. <laughs> or elephants which get you know, frustrated and can't take the, you know, the crowd. So that is why... But don't you then have to say, no, you can't come? Isn't this the unpalatable... Yes. Truth. You have to eventually. I know Tony's going to launch himself out of his chair in a second, but you have to say no. No, at some stage. Is there, isn't there a question? You know, two hundred thousand is kind of unbelievable. But uh, congratulations on buying it. Because, you beat me to it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure they'd approve of that in my union. But the reality has to be, there's markets for different processes, right? So, and I think if we look at global south, look at India, look at China. Those businesses are changing dramatically, mm. first internal flights, but then also tourism venues. Mm. So there's, there's plenty of space to go and find Correct. new opportunities. Mm -hmm. Our position is we need to make sure the infrastructure, the airports can handle it. Mm. Safety first in travel is the paramount. Mm. All of the conversations about SAF and electric engines we discussed earlier this week, they're not tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? So there's new technology, there's new jobs. We have to make the jobs attractive because you need good people. Mm. Look at the, uh, the average age in, in Africa, more than 50% young. young people. Mm. Young people want to travel, see different things. So different markets for different things, but yeah. governments, employers, unions, maturely need to prepare There's our industry. There's no common thread. I come back to this point. I come back to this point mm -hmm. that I said earlier, nobody ever wants to discuss when it comes to tourism. And the reality is it's a, it's a fragmented, very very fragmented ecosystem. Yeah. It's not like the car industry, mm. where you know, you've got the manufacturers, the, de the dealers, you know, and, and it's fairly linear mm. for, for, from putting it together. And or the oil industry and the extraction industry. <clears throat> Search, extract, refine, deliver. But oh no. Tourism has millions of people in very small, in SMEs, 
and tourism ministers who often don't carry they change. Clout. They hmm? change. Leadership but, changes. So, well, let me speak to for South, for South Africa. Oh. The fact that you can... How many have, bosses have you had? <laughs> <laughs> Enough. That, that laugh already has told you. <laughs> Too many. But that's the, that's the problem. It's not about... You know, a strategy is not meant to change. It's a tourism strategy to be implemented despite who the leader of the day is. But unfortunately, we've seen it in the African continent. It just causes disruption. You're right. What you see, of course, is the opposite in places like Dubai. Mm. Yeah. Where you have a leadership that mm. is able to say, this is our strategy, this is where we're going, yep. this is what we're going to do, and we're going to do it. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. In China, the infrastructure is built with such a long-term view. The high-speed railway from Beijing to Shanghai is the same distance from New York to Florida, four and a half hours. We're there. It takes you that long to get through LaGuardia. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think tourism... I mean, there, there are councils, etc. I don't think tourism has a small voice in government, certainly in Asia mm. anymore, because it is a great job creator. It is um, a great way of um, narrowing the wealth gap. Mm. And so it does have a good voice. Um, there is you know, lots that can be done better, mm. um, and, and topics such as this will you know, raise the ante. But I think there is probably a little bit of an overreaction right now I think there are many ways of dispersing tourism around. People want to travel. That, that's a fact. And without sounding like a Miss World, travel is good. If people get to know each other, yeah. there's less true. kind of conflict. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? I, I, I really strongly believe in that. At AirAsia, we, we brought Southeast Asia much closer together. Mm -hmm. There was so, much, so little connectivity even between Indonesia and Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of benefits of it. Mm -hmm. Can it be managed better? Absolutely. And Let me just tell you one point. Yeah. You know, I've been through everything. SARS, bird flu, tsunami, earthquakes, COVID. You know, um, we had the Bali bomb. Mm. And uh, every airline cut their flights to Bali. And I said, look, we can't do that. We have made a lot of money from the Balinese and we need to be there because the economy will collapse. Mm. Uh, so I put out 5,000 free seats because I knew Malaysians very well. If you put a free seat they will risk their lives, <laughs> okay? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not going to Bali, but free seat, I'm going. And they went, and they had a great time. And Malaysians would come back and tell 50,000 other people what a great time they had. And we never canceled a flight. So, you know, it is important. We mustn't overreact because there's a big ecosystem, as you said, mm. around the tourism industry. Can it be better? Should we be silent? Should we avoid it? I, I agree with you, we shouldn't. But I think there's a lot of mass hysteria right now, and politicians are jumping on the bandwagon and making populist um, decisions. Which is, which is the point, in a sense, that I, 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 exactly that point, relatable back. The risk for the industry is that politicians jump on a bandwagon, don't necessarily have any knowledge or real experience. Correct. Correct. Therefore, the, the classic example is APD. In, in the United Kingdom, which has made the tickets there considerably more expensive and competitively disadvantaged um, as a result. And, that, and, it, and it's happening with a lot of the environmental um, standards mm -hmm. that are being put in place. Yeah. Um, but the industry doesn't have a strong enough voice. I, I, I would agree on that. And I think the industry needs to get its act together. Many, many right, countries okay. in Southeast Asia are signing you know, carbon emission things and not fully understanding and now having the issues and going back and sorting. So I do think um, the industry has been fragmented uh, it's, and it's getting better. Uh, but you, that, that's a valid point you've made. Yeah. All right. One more question. Oh, plenty of questions. Right. We'll be quick then. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. yes. Yeah. Hello. My name is Asla Kolmberg. Um, um, in the Arctic, uh, where I come from, uh, tourism is very important uh, for the local economies, um, but um, also, especially in relation to cruise ship tourism, we've experienced that uh, if you bring thousands of people into small Arctic communities, it can have huge impacts for the local culture. Mm -hmm. um, many communities have developed their own protocols how to ensure that um, this can coexist, so I want to ask, uh, what are you doing to ensure that uh, tourism is uh, sustainable also culturally? I, I think to an extent that we've, we've, that we've heard, but, but I want to know what sort of things are local communities doing yeah. to 
basically uh, coexist with. with it. Because you still want the cruise ships, mm. don't you? Um, I don't want them. <laughs> I don't have so them. I don't have a so, coast. So are you prepared for, you know, I always remember my boss when I asked for this, that he said, right, who would you like me to fire? So, I mean, so are you prepared to lose the jobs in those Arctic communities as a result of the cruise ships not coming? Well, I think um, more small-scale tourism is the more sustainable uh, uh, solution in this sense. But uh, to give you an example, uh, like these protocols, for example, addressing what are the local livelihoods using the areas for in each season, where should you go, where not to go. Like in some areas, there are clear guidelines for this. So mm. are you doing something to ensure that the communities can um, make sure that their priorities are heard? Yeah, I think you've addressed that, but if anyone yeah. particularly wants to, to come back on I that. We, we, whenever we go to a new route, mm. part of our protocol is to meet the local community, yeah. tell us what you like, what you don't like, what we should be doing, and then we educate uh, through our own communication channels. I think we think, particularly with cruise ships, there has to be a positive impact on the local community. Mm, yeah. and, and whether that's economic or investing in protecting the environment, that needs to be debated up front because you can't just move thousands of people into an environment without protecting while you're visiting. Mm. Right. Sure, sure. Next question. I think it goes a little bit in the cruise ship directions that uh, you have just mentioned. Are we not producing over tourism? When you see the new MSC cruise ships, yeah, they host uh, 7,000 uh, tourists and the new ones that they built, maybe 9,000, 10,000. And um, so when they arrive in a smaller harbor, uh, and they all disembark, that is sort of an invasion. Yeah. <laughs> and the problem uh, for uh, the communities is uh, that those people don't spend money. Yeah? Yeah. So they have best. eaten on board yeah, and they're just walking around right. yeah, and then returning to so, the cruise ship. So uh, are we not producing over tourism? Right, but, but, but the, the, the points you raise on cruise ships are well documented in that sense. I remember 25, 30 years ago being in Key West and watching the cruise ships and then having to tend to in and 5,000 people arrived. They spent maybe 50 bucks on a T-shirt and a T-shirt and a bit of food and then back on the ship for the food. But we've known this for a while. Mm. So, it's big, right, but is your answer to ban the ships? Is that the answer? Just like Amsterdam or <coughs> Venice, we're not having the ships. Is that the answer? And what are you going to do with the money? Yeah, but what are you going to do with the money? Because APD in the UK was supposed to be for environmental issues. As far as I know, it's spent on everything except environmentally. <laughs> so how do you ring fence it? Next question. Sir at the front, and then our last question to our panel, and then we can all go off and improve the state of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm Juan Pablo Ortega. I'm from Colombia, and... I think we have a completely different problem. Uh, Colombia for many years was seen as a good place to make TV series, and today is a tourism hub, and we even have a house to promote tourism, so I invite everyone to go to Colombia. So my question is, we talk about our tourism, but I think there is still too many people in the world that haven't been able to travel, that couldn't afford to travel, and that's changing. So instead of talking about our tourism, how can we get more people around the world in China, in South America, to travel, and I think, Tony, you are the best example of this, but what do you think, uh, how can we get more people to travel to other places, like you say, the long It's growing naturally. It's, I mean, I don't, think we, I don't think that's a problem, in a sense. Mm -hmm. That's happening, in, that's happening on its own. They may not be coming to your country, but that's happening already. No, they're yeah, coming to my is... country, but not going to other countries, and I think the long tail needs to Where happen. did you last go on holiday? Last, well, I went Isn't to Verbier because I was coming to Davos, so I did a two-for-one trip, but oh. uh, I don't think that many people can afford those kind of trips. Right. So when we talk about the, the long term, I think that's a, a better problem to solve because countries like some parts of Colombia live out of tourism and they need to take cruise ships and they're happy to take cruise ships and then other cities don't want to take cruise ships. So I think the conversation is mostly not stopping over tourism, right. it's how do we shift the tourism to places that actually want it. The disbursement. Thank you, sir. Uh, by the way, World Economic Forum, you should have had a cruise ship guy here. Manfredi's <laughs> exactly. outside. Exactly. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> it would be great to have had Manfredi here. I, I know. He absolutely. asked me to promote him, so I'm doing that now. <laughs> Somehow. Uh, um, final question to each of you. 
Where are you going this year? I just went to South Pole. I just came back from No, 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 where are you going? Where you, where, you are what's, what's the trip that you're going to take this year that you're really looking forward to? Oh, after South Pole, mm, very hard to beat that one, so. Tony, you must have a destination for us somewhere. <laughs> Sorry? You must have a destination. That's... Absolutely. Where are you going this year? Planning to go to Tanzania this year. I need tranquility. Once you've done, and all the unlocking that you have done that I'm doing in South Africa, surely you deserve some time out. And why not? You're going to Zanzibar or are you going to Maine? Yeah, Zanzibar. Yeah, I was there a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I, I'm staying at home after this conference because I'm against over tourism. <laughs> <laughs> do, you know, do you know anyone who's got a good airline that you could get a, yeah. a, a, a good ticket? So, we travel a lot, so I can't even tell you the schedule over the next week, but I think the one. On I'm holiday. Looking, well, we, we have our big convention in Marrakesh, so we're bringing 2,500 people from all over the over world. Tourism, over tourism. Over tourism. That is, that is decision making <laughs> body, Tony. That is classic. <laughs> and then you're going to do a bit of pleasure. Or Morocco. Right? Yeah, Mor uh, Morocco is a very interesting place. Mm. It's worth a visit. I think we just discovered the problem. <laughs> I think we can blame the whole thing on your conference <laughs> and your summer holiday. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.